Bios Origins. Beginning 100,000 years ago, Bios Origins set you into the role as the pawns of history, not the supreme dictator whose task is to rule the world by commanding legions of obedient pawns. You are not going to build stadiums if your pawns are bored, or schools if they are ignorant. Instead, we are these pawns. And our goal is to advance our welfare, set our own goals, and suppress any dictator that may arise from our own people. Now, each of us is one of four subspecies of predator apes traveling through four epochs of syntax language development. By the end of the fourth epoch, you're going to have to, or you will have already set your own goals for victory between religious, political, or industrial disciplines. Whoever has done this the best will win the game. All right, what are you guys looking at here to begin with? Well, here on the main board, the board is essentially broken down into four different areas. We have the map of the world as it is with each area turned into a hex with six, sometimes maybe five or maybe less little corners on it or, or, or spots. Hex corners are either brown or blue, which brown representing land, blue representing water. Now, four of these have thick colored outlines, which are where the starting spots are. So you'll notice for the green player, there is a blue with a green outline and a brown with a green outline. Well, we're playing the land version, so that's where that one's going to start. Yellow, black, and white. Call it white or cream, neither here nor there. Now, there are four types of hexes in this game. There are permanent, or, uh, permanent ocean, which are these blue filled in areas out here. There is permanent ice, which is uninhabitable. Then there are shelf hexes. Now these have blue climate rings and they're either habitable or if they're flooded, they're uninhabitable. Then there are continental hexes, which are everything else. And these have either no ring, a white, an orange, or a green ring. Well, speaking of those climate rings, those are inside many of the hexes, as you see. These represent what may happen to that hex to make it uninhabitable when covered with, you know, forests or desert or ice, etc., etc. The stars that you see on some of these hexes out here are only there for, star, uh, for setup for the different player counts. Now, there are resources of various types inside some of the hexes, they're either white, brown, or black, and we have a little kind of handy dandy little legend or player aid over here that represent, that shows what all the different uh, resource icons are in there. Now, in addition to that, there are little 20 pointed stars out here, which are catastrophes that may happen throughout the game, and they're marked with either a one, two, three, or four, which shows which epoch those catastrophes may happen, and it shows the location. So we have Toba here. We have, I'm going to find some that I can actually pronounce. We have Krakatoa here in Epoch 4, etc., etc. Now, down below, we have three disciplines of focus and tech trees, which also is the scoring of the game. So on the left-hand side here, we have the culture discipline, which has a mysticism pool, as well as two environmental tracks, as you can see here. The top one being the footprint track, and the bottom one being the energy track. <coughs> In addition, there are victory point holding locations for each of the three disciplines, here, here, and here. In the middle, we have the politics discipline, with the urbanized, or the buildings, the constructed city track on top, then two full welfare tracks. We have metallurgy and immunology. I'm going to struggle with that word all day, so just get used to it, guys. Then we have the industrial discipline over here with the diversity track and two economy tracks, one being maritime, one being information. 
Then those are the four main areas on the board. In addition, we have the philosophy track up here. And then as I mentioned earlier, a map legend over there. So that's everything you're looking at on the main board. Now off board, we have a market of cards, as you can see here. There are three different decks of idea cards and three cards of each matching both the epoch and the discipline. So these being culture cards, these being political cards, these being industrial cards, all from epoch one because we're in the first epoch. That makes sense. Now over on the left hand side of the board we have the challenge deck which is the timer of the game. That is comprised of two different types of cards. Challenge cards, as you can see, that are horizontal or in landscape. And then we have comic cards, which are going to be in portrait to, and again, that being the timer of the game. And up above the board, we have the victory point chits up there. Then over on our player tableaus here. Now, this is only set up to look like this to be able to fit on my camera here for right now. But you have two different placards. You have the brain card or brain placard, and you have your main action placard. In addition to that, you have migrants over here. Now, on your brain placard, this is going to hold pawns in three different groups of emotions when they're at the bottom, vocabulary in the middle, and free will at the top. There, everything else on this brain card that you see up here is all player aid. The main action placard, or what I'm going to refer to going forward as your placard, this is the three disciplines with one of them being your ruling class. So you can see that white is going to start, or culture is going to start as my ruling class. If it were over here, it would be in politics or industry respective. Now, what these are going to do is these are going to hold those idea cards that are from the market tucked in underneath our placard to place in over there. And then there's going to be foundation cards which are going to come up there on the bottom part of the card. Then, as I said, we have our migrant pool which shows our ver or holds our migrants. And last but not least, and I'm gonna actually show this slowly, this is the Rosetta Stone. Don't go running scared, it's not as scary as it looks but these are all of the available actions that each player has throughout the game. Not all of these actions are going to be available at any given time. You might only have a, at any given time, maybe three or four of them available to you. On the flip side of that is the flow chart that shows the round or how a turn actually works. Again, it looks intimidating, but it flows very simply. All right, so just bear with us, stick with it, and I promise you it's not nearly as scary as it looks. All right, so how do you play Bios Origins? Well, the goal of Bios Origins is to score the most victory points in one of the three disciplines and have that discipline score at the end of the game. One discipline, other discipline, third discipline. In all three, I'm sorry, each player is going to score victory points at the end of the game in all three disciplines, but only their highest scoring one will count. Unless tied, then it's going to be cumulative between all three disciplines. You're going to get victory points for any victory point chits that you have accumulated in a given discipline, be it at the end of the first epoch, the second epoch, or the third epoch. And in addition to that, if for culture, you're going to score any markers, any pawns that you have here in your mysticism pool, as well as the value of where you would advance <coughs> on those two check tracks. So for instance, if I have made it here and here respectively, I will score 10 points plus whatever I have here in the mysticism pool, plus any accumulated victory point chits when we score Epoch 1. That's what my score or any of our scoring would be in culture. For politics, it's going to be, again, accumulated victory points, how many cities you have on the board, as well as where you are on each of these tracks. And finally, for industry, it's where you are on each of these tracks. Now, I do want to point out that you'll notice that if you reach the top of this track, it will be eight and eight, respectively, for 16 points, 16 points here, 
but only 14 here. So the, the cumulative numbers are different, so, and the way they get there are going to be different, so be aware of that. Whoever has the highest score in one of the three disciplines, or in their highest discipline, wins. So big picture, what are you going to be doing in the game of Bios Origins? First, you're going to choose to challenge the gods or not. This is both the timer of the game as well as will provide players with foundations, which are cards in their tableau, which will provide them more actions. Then, after you've chosen to either challenge or not, you're going to take a number of actions on your turn, moving pawns from your brain placard onto the market to claim ideas which provide more actions or into the mysticism pool which can provide points as well as possible auction bonuses. In addition to that, you're going to be putting migrants out on the board and spreading out eventually founding cities again for gaining victory points as well as improving your position on the board. Now, when a comet card is visible in the challenge deck, it is the topmost card, and a player then chooses to claim it, it will then trigger the change of an epoch and the game will pause while we do an intermediate scoring. And that will take place which will be dictated by what epoch we're in. Based on our mysticism in epoch 1, our cities in epoch 2, and our diversity in epoch 3. At the end of the fourth epoch, when the fourth comet card is uh, claimed or taken, the game ends immediately and then we go into final scoring. So now, how do you actually play? The game takes place over four epochs, with each epoch consisting of an indeterminate number of player turns. Each, each epoch lasts until the challenge card has been claimed for that e or the comic or all the challenge cards for that epoch and the comic card has been claimed by a player. Within each epoch, Players will take turns going clockwise around the table, taking their entire turn before passing on to the next player. Each player's turn will consist of the same three phases. Phase one, challenge the gods. Phase two, activities, which is the meat of the game. Take your actions in the game. And the third one is a footprint and restore the market step. All right? So step one, challenge the gods. All right, I'm going to do something a little unorthodox. We're actually going to skip this because you have to have context as to why you would want to and how you go about doing that. So we're going to actually double back to the challenge of the gods after we've talked about the other two steps, okay? So looking at our handy dandy little flow chart, and you know what? I'm going to put this right here. This whole area right here in the top is challenging of the gods. If you either elect not to challenge the gods or after you have finished challenging the gods, you then go into your activism phase, which is right here. Now, this is a series of actions based on your ruling class. So, what we're going to do now is I'm going to move this off camera for right now, and we're going to focus here on our main placard, okay? Our ruling class, for me, is going to be culture to start the game. On your turn during your activities phase, you're going to start work your way bottom to top, working your way up on your placard and any possible foundation cards that you may have, and you may do one icon per line moving bottom to top. So what does that mean? Well, I only have one action icon on this, so I would be able to take that one action. It is always a may. You were never forced to take this action. If you choose not to take this action, that's fine, you can skip it. However, once you have advanced past it moving up, you cannot come back and do this action or the, any series of actions on that turn. Does that make sense? Makes sense. After that, you're then going to choose any one of those four actions and then, finally, I can do any one of those two actions. Again, we are playing the advanced game, so this little series of dots right there that shows this symbol and if basic game, ignore everything to the right of that, whether it's there for a ruling class, here, or here. So, again, on your turn, 
take one action per line moving bottom to top. Does that make sense? Yep. We're going to cover eight of the main actions of the game up front and then the rest as we get to them during the game. Because again, there's a lot of possible actions in this game, but they're all bite sized and they're all very simple. Mm -hmm. But the ones we're going to cover are the four main ones that are right here that are the same for all four, three ruling classes, as well as the top left one for each of them, which is the same. So that's five that are identical. And then one different one here, one different one here, and one different one here. And those are the only main actions that we're going to cover during the activities phase. Okay? All right. So we're going to start off with the very first one, which is, oh, sorry, lost my spot. Specialize. All right. So the specialize action, this says it's a knowledge action. It moves pawns from your free will into the market as elders, and each action moves a number of pawns based on your information stage. Well, that's a lot of words. All right. So what we're going to do now is we're going to bring you our placard Actually, we're going to do this so you guys can see this. So we're talking about this action right here, which is specialize. Okay? Let me bring your attention for a moment to your brain. Everybody's brain looks the same to start with in this version of the game that we're playing. Everyone has seven pawns on their brain placard. Four start in emotions, two in vocabulary, one in free will. When they are in free will, they are essentially a currency in the game. There are exceptions to that, but for the most part, you want to get these pawns up to your free will to then be able to go out to be able to do things on your behalf. As it is, you start with one pawn in free will. And the specialized action says you may take any number of pawns from your free will that matches the level of your information. So our information starts at one, which means we can take one free will pawn from here and then place it out here on the market. So now let's go ahead and talk about the market. So there are nine cards at any given time out here on the market. And those cards are going to allow you to enhance your actions during your activities phase. Now, this being a market, it's going to be a conveyor if you're familiar with any kind of PAX type game. So this being the most expensive card with these being the most inexpensive. These cost one pawn, two pawns, and three pawns, okay? I'll go into the details of that here now. If you have a pawn on your turn, or here, that will allow that to be able to be claimed. If you have a two pawns, whether it's yours and somebody else's, or possibly two of your own, then that card is allowed to be claimed, and that goes for the entire row. If, however, on the top row, there must be a minimum of three, there could be more like so, okay? So again, the specialized action is taking from your brain placard, from free will, however many, so if he had, let's say Ken had three of them up there, and his information was at two, it would allow him to take two of his pawns, put them out here into the market on any mix of cards. He can put them on the same one, any mix that he wishes. And when they're out here, they are now termed elders. That's simply vocabulary. That's, that's all the difference, okay? So does that action make sense? Is yep. that, I mean, that's pretty simple. Yep. Okay? All right. The second action now that we're going to talk about here is going to be invent, okay? This one allows you to actually, now that you have bids or you have elders out on the cards, now to be able to claim those cards, you want to invent or to take those cards. So, how does that work? Well, as long as there are a minimum amount of pawns or as they're called elders out there, on a given card, on your turn, as long as you have at least one elder on that card, you may then claim it. So, let's say, for instance, I had one here, and I wish to claim that card. I can do so. But before we get into the details of that, I feel like we should go ahead and go over the anatomy of one of these idea cards, okay? 
So first off, you'll notice in the top left-hand corner, it's going to have one, two, three, or four. That's from what epoch it's in. It's also going to have two colors at the top. It's going to have a main color, which is the discipline in which it belongs. And then on the down below it, just right there, you're going to see a secondary color on it. And the reason for that is so that when this is tucked into your placard, you know what the other color is without having to pull it out and take it out there. It also shows a list of available actions, the symbols for that. Then it has some sort of artwork and a description on what the actual idea is. Then down below it, it has a Eureka or a one-time bonus that is going to be available for players when they claim this card. And then a requirement in which for them to be able to maintain or hold on to that idea and add it to their tableau. And the exact same is if the card is upside down, it's just whether or not it's going to be culture and industry or politics or culture, depending on the color. Does that make sense? Yep. All the icons up here, I'm going to go over here in detail as we go along, but just know that's the anatomy of a card, okay? So, the invent action says, if you have the right amount of elders out here on the board, or on a certain card, you may then claim that card. And let's say, for argument's sake, we had something along the lines of that on this card. So what's going to happen at that point is, and I'm going to have to kind of do like so, that'll work. All right, I'm claiming this hand axe card as my invent action, as you see here, okay? So it has a minimum of one elder of my color on it. Good to go, no problem. So the first thing that's going to happen is I get the Eureka. The Eureka is a one-time immediate bonus for every pawn color that is on that card. Well, you'll notice I have two there, but it's still just my color. So I get to take the Eureka once. When you do so, you're going to take these and move them back into free will immediately and then you take what the Eureka is. And the Eureka in this case, that iconography looks a whole lot like this one, which is encephalize. Which, what does that mean? That means move upon from emotions up to vocabulary. Easy enough. Then the next step is anybody else that had a pawn, or I'm sorry, an elder on this card, then immediately gets to take the Eureka as well. Again, regardless of how many they have on here. So in this case, Jess gets to take the encephalize action. The encephalize action is, well, she gets this, puts it back onto her free will, and then moves one of her pawns from emotion up to vocabulary, boom, there you go. So that's the kind of consolation prize for being on the card that someone else claims. Does that make sense? Yep. yep. All right. The next step now is checking to see if you've met the requirements of what that card and the requirements will all be different across all the cards, across all the epochs, if I can keep this card. So this requirement is called menopause. This one looks a whole lot like this icon down here, which says you must have two or less pawns in emotions. Well, you'll notice that I have three. Ergo, I do not meet that requirement, meaning I cannot keep that card, which means we're going to tear this out apart. <sighs> no, just kidding. We're just going to discard it into a discard pile, which the game so eloquently names Lore Deck. Okay? So, discard, Lore Deck, same thing. So, I cannot keep this because I don't have the requirement, so I'm going to discard it out of the game. However, let's say I had this. I now have met that requirement for this. So then I can claim this card, but there is one other unwritten requirement. I must match one of the two colors with my ruling class. So my ruling class here you'll see is culture, which is white. It does have a white one, which means I must flip this card over, tuck it in like so, and boom, all of a sudden that has become an idea and now it's a new level or new row of actions that I can take. Obviously, in this case, action singular. Mm -hmm. Whereas, if my ruling class were over here, I would have to choose this action, or this uh, ruling class in which to place it, and those would be my available actions. Does that make sense? Nope. Any questions on that? Nope. nope. Okay. The last thing that I would like to point out on the invent here is, 
This says information. Max elders gain per specialize, as we explained with mm -hmm. Ken's action, but also the max ideas that you can have in your tableau. What does that mean? Well, let's say I had other ones out here, so on and so forth, to where then on a subsequent turn, I want to do then go ahead and invent this card. Note that me being orange, yellow-ish here, my information is only at one. So what that means is when I take this card, I then put this back onto my free will as I've done before. I then get to take whatever the Eureka is. And even if I've met the requirement, which in this case is two footprint, I cannot keep this card. Or I can, but I have two ideas now. I'm only limited to one. I have to get rid of one. I can get rid of this one or this one, my choice. If I had multiple, I could get rid of any one of those. That is the invent action. Any questions on that? Makes sense. Okay. Let's go ahead and put those back out there. All right. The next action that we're going to talk about now is the library action. Library has that little column right there. And the library action is pretty simple in that expend a number of elders equal to your information stage and advance your information one step. Okay, what does that mean? Well, say I have a bunch of elders out here on these cards. I'm tired of only having one idea and only being able to put out one pawn at a time as an elder because I'm only allowed one. To, to up your information, you take the library action. I am currently at information one, which means I recall any one of these, bring it back into my free will here, and then I increase that to there. So if I choose to take a library action on a subsequent turn or in a subsequent row, I then would have to recall two elders from out here to then put into free will, which when I do that, that will advance that. That's also, remember, increasing the amount of ideas that I can keep in my tableau. That's the library action. Pretty simple. Any questions on that one? No. All right. Makes sense. Moving on. We're going to skip the elect action for right now, and we're going to move on up to this row. This row, this one that looks like kind of a uh, dandelion or mushroom spore, that it, it's all about spreading or being able to go forth and multiply on the actual map or board itself. So the spread action either moves an existing migrant, and when these pawns are out here, they're called migrants, you're either going to move an existing migrant or it creates a new migrant on top of an existing map token. Okay. In either case, move the migrant a number of spots up to its reach. Okay, so I'm yellow. I have two options on my turn, and actually we'll go ahead and let Greg be, uh, be Vanna on this one. He has two options. So we're going to take a look first off here at the energy track. The energy track down here in the bottom left hand corner says the max number of spots in spread. Well if you're taking the spread action that means right now any of us can move a total of three spots. And remember at the very beginning I had mentioned that there are two colors of spots. There are brown land and there are blue water. Well currently our maritime is at zero, which means you ain't going over water. So your max spread in a single action is moving one pawn or one migrant a maximum of three spaces. So go ahead, Greg, move that three spaces. One, two, three, easy enough. Now he could not move this way, nor could he move this way because again, water, okay? Easy enough, mm -hmm. boom, all right, put him back. Now. The other option when you spread is you can add another migrant to an existing location where you have a token. A token being an existing migrant or a city. Now cities, which I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but cities will be in hexes out here. So let's say it were something along the lines of like this. If you have a city out there, you can place a migrant on any hex corner or any spot where that surrounds that city. So in this case, any of those available spots except water. You can never end your movement in water. Why? Because we're land-based creatures. I don't care how high your maritime goes, you cannot end your movement in water. So 
that right there would be creating a new migrant. But then they get the spread. So go for it. This one also, his limit is three. There you go, easy enough, boom, done. That's spread. Either move an existing or add one to an existing location and spread. Any questions on that? Nope. Pretty simple. Now, if, for instance, Greg had chosen to do something along the lines of this, that will be foolish, and I will explain that here when we get to the end and the upkeep step in this. Okay? All right. So no questions on spread, correct? Correct. All right. So the next action that we're going to talk about now is this one right here, which is art. And we're going to kind of pair that in conjunction with another action that is called prayer. Okay, so now I mentioned that everything on your brain here is a player aid except for this right here. So you'll notice that prayer here allows you to move a pawn from anywhere on your brain and put it into the mysticism pool on the map. So, oh, maybe I may take, say here, this emotion and put it out here in my mysticism pool. That is the prayer action. Why do you care about that? because this art action now allows you to expend or bring back a pawn from your mysticism pool into free will. Oh, so this guy now comes back and then comes into free will. So it just went out as emotion, came back as free will, and now I can use this to go ahead and put it out there on the market, so on and so forth. That's it saves you from having to encephalize and then later on abstraction. Does that make sense? Yep. These are all big fancy words for really simple actions. So, prayer. Move a dude from emotions to mysticism. Art, pull a dude from mysticism, put it back in free will. Easy enough. Okay? So we've now covered those three and those two actions, plus a couple of others like prayer, etc., etc. Okay? Yep. The next one we're going to talk about even though I said to ignore this icon, the icon's going to come up in the game, and these kind of work, they're kind of uh, correlated, okay? So this one here is the prospect. This is how you build cities in the game. You're going to exchange a migrant into a city in the hex that it occupies with their black resource icon. Okay, so wow, let's take a look at that. So out here on the board, there are a bunch of different black icons. There are two that have to do specifically with, well, all four have to do with prospecting. So anywhere you see these black icons out here on the board, you can build cities via the prospect action, okay? Mm -hmm. I do wanna point out that any of these blue numbered ones out here are unavailable. We have no water cities. This is not Atlantis, so we can only build on land. Now. I would like to point out that this technically is Hawaii, so these are not in blue, ergo you can build there. Okay? All right. So provided that you, let's say here, Greg, provided he has met the prerequisite for this opal right here, which this requirement is his metallurgy must be at level two. So if his metallurgy were at two, he can take this specific prospect action, provided that were his ruling class, which that one says, any luxury item, well this is a luxury item, he then can take a city, replace that migrant, and cover that action, and this goes back into his pool, congrats, he now has a city, and he has a city value of one, that'll be worth one victory point when we get there, yeah, golf clap, congrats, okay, that's the prospect action, build the city, it's going to be very similar for both domesticate as well as cultivate. It just has to do with different icons out here on the board. Domesticate has to do with animals. There are two types of animals out here. There are war animals and there are work animals, which have a very, very minor distinction. Then the cultivate action has to do with the white icons, building cities in those. Very simple. So three icons, one action, building a city, okay? Mm -hmm. Any questions on that? Nope. nope. All right. Finally, we're going to come around now to this elect action. <laughs> yep. 
Yeah, we'll go ahead and do this. All right. Elect allows you to change your ruling class from where it is to one of the other ruling classes. What's going to happen first is you need to expend all your elders. So if you have some elders out here, expend means you're going to bring them back and put them into free will. And then you're going to set the ruling class to whatever it is that you want to do. So you know what? I don't want to be cultured anymore. I want to be industrial. I move it over here. So now what I would like to point out is this handy dandy little rainbow symbol right here with a little dude on it. This is both diversity, which is going to come in. This is why we all start with one on our diversity track, because everybody starts with one diversity. However, this is room for dissidents. Various times throughout the game, we're going to have to remove people from the board, or, uh, Ica, or pieces from the board. And when we do, that upsets people. They become dissidents. So we're going to go ahead and put a dissident on there. If at any point you choose to change the ruling class via the elect action, you then get rid of all your dissidents. To get rid of dissidents, well, you're going to have to remove more pieces from the board to then get rid of them and quell the, the, the dissidents, okay? Very simple, just like that. Remove from the board any one of your pieces. I'll get into that in detail here in a little bit. Change the ruling class. Boom. There. However, at that point, your ideas then will change. Any ideas that you had over here in your previous ruling class go in one of two places. They will either, if they have that other color, they will transfer over in the same order. So if the this one were the bottom one and then had more up top, they would re remain in the same order. However, if I had changed my ruling class here to politics, you'll notice that this card has no politics. So any guesses as to what happens? Goes lore away. pile. There you go. Gets discarded into the lore pile. Easy enough. All right. The last one that we're not really going to cover too much in depth here is war. It is what's called a transaction. In other words, destroy other people's stuff, take it over, etc., etc. We're not going to cover that one right now. We're going to cover that as it comes up during the game. Okay. All right? So again, to rehash the activities phase, what you're going to be doing is a series of actions starting bottom to top, one per row, take an action if you wish, and then that's it. Okay? Any questions on the activities phase? Nope. Obviously, there are a lot more actions than what I covered there. The next step is the footprint slash restore the market phase, which is we're going to check our limits of our pieces. Our footprint says max tokens per hex. We all start with one token per hex. Well, let's go back. And earlier I had said, hey, maybe that wouldn't be the smartest thing for Greg to do. Because we then look at every one of the hexes that he has pieces on. You'll notice that these two migrants are on the same hex, meaning somebody's going to starve. One of them dies and comes back. There you go. And now we check this hex because he has a piece. If he had a migrant left there, that would happen as well. That piece would starve. Okay? Now... I would also like to point out that if I had a piece over here, depending on whose turn it is, their piece will starve. So in this case, if it's Greg's turn, his piece would starve. If it were my, pe my turn, my piece would starve, because you only check starvation or the footprint at the end of your turn, okay? Then refresh the market. That's pretty simple. Re Move these down, refill at the top with a new card from the deck. Mm -hmm. There you go. So that's 90% of the game right there. But now we have to double back, as I promised, to talk about the challenge of the gods there. So is the very first action that you can choose on your turn is to challenge the gods. Now, challenging the gods has a number of steps depending on what it is that you want to do and what card is visible. So if you see that it is a challenge card, as you see there, as long as you have some number, and I'm going to do something along the lines of something like that, 
There we go. And obviously the other guys are not mm. playing in this case. Sorry about that. That's <laughs> fine. Let's say it's my turn, and I say, hey, I do want to challenge the gods. There is a challenge card that is available there, so here's what's going to happen on that. These are what challenge cards look like. We'll go over the anatomy very quickly of a challenge card. The epoch is shown in the top right-hand corner. It may or may not have a little asterisk. If it does have an asterisk, that means that it's going to be a uh, religious card and will have a be able to augment your bid for this card. I'll talk more about that in a little bit. It may or may not have a diversity uh, icon on here, is, and it may or may not also have a place for a dissident on here. Okay, then possible actions for culture ruling class, possible actions for other ruling classes. In this case, this would be industry or politics. Every event will then have two, or every uh, challenge card will then have two events that will take place. We will resolve these left to right, which will be a cooling or a heating card. You'll see cooling here, heating there, and then usually some sort of global uh, Negative, possibly, thing not, that not will happen. Thing. Yeah. yeah, so the, we will resolve these two events left to right. Then, it, every card will have a Eureka and possibly a requirement. You'll see this one does not, this one does. So, when you say you're going to challenge a card, or challenge the gods, first thing that's going to happen, we're going to flip one of these face up, and then we're going to resolve the two events. The player that challenged the gods is going to be the one that dictates where these events will take place, if applicable. This one being warming, which is very simple. In the advanced game, we're going to draw a second epoch card from those that are out of the game, and we're going to look at the leftmost event. The leftmost event, if it's the same, if it's a warming card in this case, then something will happen. If not, ignore it. So in this case, we would ignore it. If it looked like this, then it would trigger summer in that case. But again, I'm getting ahead of myself because we're not going to go over these in detail until we actually play. Resolve that, and the player that challenged the gods gets to dictate where that takes place. Then we do whatever the other event is, which is going to be some kind of universal negative usually. Then we're going to have an auction for this card. Here's what you can auction with. Elders out here in the market, as well as if any player has, and let's say it were like this, if a player has any pawns on other players' idea cards, that's called emissaries. They also can bid with emissaries. So your any pawn or any elders and any emissaries, i.e. pawns that are out here, mm -hmm. you can bid with. If it's a religious card, you then can augment your bid by with adding whatever number of pawns you have here to your total bid, but you must include a bid of one with one out here or one out there as an emissary. Does that make sense? Yes. The player that challenged the gods sets the bid. They start. So in this case, let's say I bid two. Then it will go clockwise from there. Jess, on her turn, what does she bid? She either ups her bid or passes. If you pass, you're out. She could bid... Three. Right, because one, two, and augmented because it's a religious card. So her bid could be three. Well, the other guys don't have enough to be able to compete with that. She outbid me. It's a once around, so that's it. Jess wins the card. So in that case, she has to pay her bid, which is one, two. That one will stay there, uh, as always. They will come back into free will. That was just an augmented bid. Nice score. And then she's going to then claim this card. She gets to do the Eureka and her alone. And then if she meets the requirement, she must put this card into her tableau. Mm -hmm. Now, what I would like to point out is she can play, and I, I said must, I do mean must, whether it matches her ruling class or not, okay? So she would take the prayer action, provided she had menopause, meaning two or fewer on her brain, here, in emotion. At that point, she then chooses where to put the card. Now you'll notice that her ruling class is politics. If that had purple, so for instance, 
If it were that card instead, she could choose to place it there. She is not required to. If she chooses to, she then would put it into the bottom part of her tableau, and that is now a foundation, and just like all the others, it's now another row of actions, mm -hmm. and that will be the earliest action in which she can take during her activities phase. Does that make sense? Yep. yep. All right. But if she chose to not have it in her ruling class, she then could move it, she must then move it over to the other one. She's going to have a revolution, but it's going to be a quiet revolution. It's not going to be very violent. It's going to be very, very simple to do. She'll move over ideas, et cetera, et cetera, and her ruling class will then become culture. If it were this card, she would then obviously have to have a revolution because her ruling class is politics and neither is an option on this card. Does that make sense? Yep. All right. So that's challenging of the gods for the most part. So we just covered the majority of this part of the flow chart. However, if it's a comic card, that is the trigger for the timer of the game. What happens at that point, if it's a comic card, is first off, every player is going to every player is going to have, I'm sorry, lost my train of thought, is going to uh, have a chaos. A chaos means you're going to lose a piece from the board, okay? Be it a city, a migrant, an elder, etc, etc. Sorry. You're going to lose a piece from the board out here. And that's going to cause dissidence. Remember earlier that we talked about dissidence? It's going to place onto any available dissident space on your player board. If you do not have room for the dissidence that you take, you're now going to have a violent revolution, which we'll cover that when we get there. Okay? All right. The first step in the comment is you're going to, every, every player in player order is going to take one chaos. That may temporarily interrupt the game so that they can have a revolution, whether they want to or not. It's going to happen. And then at that point, afterwards, after the uh, chaos has happened, we're going to renovate the market. What does that mean? We're going to remove, it's the end of an epoch. We're going to remove these and bring out the next epoch cards. Then any card out here that does not have an elder on it is going to get wiped. All the remaining cards are going to drop down and then we're going to refill the market with the new epoch cards. Pretty simple. Then we're going to do comet scoring. Comet scoring is pretty simple. Go ahead and give me three, one of you guys, give me three, throw them out there. All right, literally. <laughs> That's the best I can do. All right. There we go. So Comet scoring works very simple like this. In the first epoch, you're going to look at how many more pawns you have out in your mysticism compared to everyone else. So in this case, Ken has three, zero, two, and one. So Ken is going to be ahead of three. He's going to get three victory point chits in here. Easy enough. Then Greg is going to get zero. He's ahead of none. I will get two because I'm ahead of those two, and Jess would get one because she's ahead of here. That's comet scoring. We would do the same whether it's for cities, same idea, diversity, exact same idea. Whether it's epoch one, epoch two, epoch three. Epoch four, game ends, and we go into final scoring. Okay? Yep. Final scoring is pretty simple. You add up the number of victory point chits that you have in that uh, discipline. You add up any markers that you have there or have out on the board as it were or where your diversity marker is respectively. Add up the points based on where you are on the tracks. Whichever one is the highest, that's your score. Compare it to everybody else's. Highest score between the three, highest score wins. There's one more thing though. Once somebody has claimed one of those Comet cards, they're going to keep that Comet card and flip it over. It becomes a Bellwether card. On a subsequent turn, if a player chooses to challenge the gods, in lieu of challenging the gods, they can discard their Bellwether card to now move the philosophy track in one direction. One, one, or, two space, or, one or two spaces in 
any direction. So, if you're familiar with the game Churchill, this will look familiar. It's a tug of war. It maybe move it this way. And then if it were there and want to move it back, it would go to there. If it were here and you want to move it too, you could go one, two. You can move it in any direction. What this is going to do is it's going to possibly eliminate the possibility of one of these three disciplines scoring at the end of the game, as well as when certain things trigger certain events, this will dictate what type of event triggers based on the challenge cards as they come up, all right? As well as uh, added chaos for nasty things like preach, war, and enslave, okay? That's pretty much it. So again, to recap, on your turn, you may challenge the gods, either bellwether card, challenge card, or comet card, whichever is visible or whichever you choose to do in the case of a bellwether card. Or if you choose not to do that, or after you do that, you then, on your turn, take your activity space going bottom to top, taking one of each row, and then we're going to have a refresh, which is the footprints and market refresh, Rinse and repeat, do that over four epochs. Whoever has the most points wins. And in a nutshell, that's how you play Bios Origins. Any questions? I'm getting a lot of shaking. That shows well no. on camera. <laughs> All right. Now, before we get started, the last thing that I do want to point out. This game has a ton of different ways to play it. Basic or advanced? Classic, as we are, on the back side of this map is a huge ocean. Mm. You can then use some of these tiles that come in the game, and you can make your own custom continents, essentially, mm -hmm. right? Or you can use the Kratons from Bios Megafauna 2 to set up your own continents on the other side of this board as well. Then, even on this side, do you want to be merfolk, or do you want to be land-based? And I mention that because... On the other side of your player board, everybody has a merfolk type as opposed to your regular and matching on this one as well. So everybody has merfolk or land based. And again, that would dictate whether you're playing in the water or whether you're playing on land. And then if you're playing the advanced game, the first or second dispersal. Now at the very beginning, I mentioned this takes place 100,000 years ago. That's because we're playing the second dispersal. If you're playing the first dispersal, you get more pawns on here, but it starts two million years in the past and comes up. So it's a longer game. That's the epic game variant. Then there's solitaire, there's co-op, and there's a campaign game. If you want, you can take Bios Genesis, roll that into Bios Megafauna 2, and then from that, roll it into this, and then, yes, with High Frontier 4 coming out later on... <laughs> next month, uh -huh. or we'll come into Kickstarter, I guess, next month, you can then roll the end result of this into High Frontier asymmetric starting positions. All right? Whoo! All right, let's actually play this game, shall we? Hey, right at an hour. I'll take it.